Chapter Thirteen of Baiting the Bears by a Self Made Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen In Which Enoch Puts His Foot in It. In the meantime, Reese and Weaver held a powwow over the situation. They were not quite certain as to what extent they could congratulate themselves upon the success of their plot against Phil Thorne. They knew that Mr. Lockwood was predisposed in the boy's favor if from nothing else but gratitude for phil's interference with rowland's murderous attack and they feared that the lad's square denial of the guilt would have its effect on the banker he may bring a detective into the case said the cashier and have you and enoch put through the third degree if your nephew should weaken under fire the three of us might find ourselves in a bad hole what have you done with the rest of the bonds i slipped them under the safe replied reese well if you take my advice you'll get them outside of the office as soon as possible you can't tell but the whole office may be overhauled at any moment send them up to your house by enoch right away i think i will decided the bookkeeper accordingly reese called his nephew to the counting room and handed him an ordinary looking parcel in which he had concealed the securities with directions to leave it at his house after enoch had departed reese breathed more freely it wanted a few minutes of five when a sharp-eyed man with a business-like air entered the office and inquired for mr lockwood weaver showed him into the private room that's a detective as sure as your name is reese he said to the bookkeeper when he returned to the counting room do you think so asked reese nervously i'm certain of it i'll have to caution enoch this evening as to what he may expect tomorrow. if we both stick to our stories i can't see how any detective can break us down He'll be up to Thorne to corroborate his own statement. I fail to see how he can do it without a witness. One of the bonds having been found in his possession, and with two credible witnesses ready to swear he was handling the package of securities alongside of the old man's desk, I think we have him dead to rights, said Weaver. I think it probable that Lockwood will let him go, but will not prosecute him. I see that he didn't return to his desk after his interview with the boss that is encouraging on the whole i hope so replied the bookkeeper as he put on his hat and coat preparatory to going home at that moment marie passed both the men on her way out and she didn't notice either even by so much as a glance she had always disliked reese and especially weaver but now she felt an utter contempt for the two men as she held them responsible for the trouble which had fallen upon phil that afternoon she had grown to think of a great deal of the bright gentlemanly boy who was her frequent escort to the brooklyn bridge cars and not for one moment would she believe him guilty of the crime under the suspicion of which he had fallen the banker put the case into the detective's hands and after the employees had all departed for their homes the sleuth searched every nook and corner of the office for a trace of the missing bonds needless to say his labor was wasted much to the surprise of reese and weaver phil appeared at his desk the next morning and went on with his work enoch was also astonished to see him on the premises and the three held a talk on the subject they didn't like the look of it had the scheme failed if so was something going to drop in another direction each of them experienced a feeling of uneasiness as the morning advanced which was not lessened by the reappearance of the detective phil was called into the private office and examined by the sleuth then he was sent out to find the bootblack who had figured into the brick bat incident that youth was introduced through the private door and his evidence implicated enoch so clearly that the messenger was asked in to face him he's a liar cried enoch when called upon to defend himself i never dropped that brick out of the window the bootblack however was positive in his identification i'm afraid i shall have to put you under arrest young man and take you up to the tombs said the detective severely on her arrest gasped enoch turning fairly green from fear that is unless you make a clean breast of what you know about the disappearance of that package of bonds from mr lockwood's desk yesterday i don't know anything about it replied enoch doggedly didn't you tell mr lockwood that you saw thorne standing beside his desk with the bonds in his hands yes do you still maintain that story Yes you are ready to go to court and swear to that fact are you yes replied enoch with a trace of uneasiness which was not lost on the sharp eyes of the detective what were you doing in the clothes closet just before thorne went there for his coat and hat yesterday afternoon 
I wasn't doing nothing there. You mean to say you wasn't there at the time? No, I wasn't there. Call the boy, Willie, asked the detective calmly. Enoch began to look frightened. He had no idea anyone had seen him when he went to the closet to put the bond into Phil's pocket. He thought he made sure he was unobserved. Willie made his appearance in answer to the banker's ring. In response to the detective's question, he asserted positively he had seen Enoch go to the closet at the time mentioned. Do you know what he was doing there? No, sir. What have you to say to that? asked the detective, turning to the messenger. I, I didn't go there, persisted Enoch with a vindictive glance at the little office boy. You deny that you put that bond in Thorne's overcoat pocket? I didn't put it in his pocket. Did you see anybody enter the office while Mr. Lockwood was in the corridor? Nobody but Phil Thorne. If anybody else had gone into this room, you would have seen them, would you not? I guess so. Don't you know? thundered the detective. Yes, faltered Enoch in a scared voice. Isn't it a fact that your uncle, Mr. Reese, came in here at that time? No, he didn't. Are you sure of that? persisted the detective, boring the messenger through and through with his gimlet-like eyes. Yes, I'm sure of it. Are you positive he didn't pass through the reception room? Yes. If he had been in the reception room at all, you would have seen him? Yes. Will you ring for Mr. Reese? asked the detective of the banker. Mr. Reese, said the detective pleasantly, you stated yesterday afternoon before Mr. Lockwood that you saw Thorne standing beside this desk, with a package of bonds since missing in his hand, is that right? Yes, that is the fact. Where were you standing at the time? In the reception room, close to the door of this room, which was slightly ajar. Where was this boy at the time? Indicating Enoch. Sitting in his chair by the window. Are you positive about that? "'Yes, sir,' replied Reese, wondering what the detective was driving at. "'Then he saw you at the door, did he?' "'I suppose he did,' replied the bookkeeper in a slightly hesitating way, as if uncertain whether this answer would help his cause or not. "'I should like to find some evidence corroboratory of the fact that you actually were in possession to see that Thorne had the bonds in his hands.' The bait was greedily swallowed by Reese. I am quite sure Enoch saw me standing there. You remember the fact, don't you, Enoch? And he glanced meaningly at his nephew. Much to his surprise, the boy answered surly, No, I don't. You wasn't in here at all. Why, Enoch, how can you say that? You know, I don't know nothing. But my dear sir, said Reese, I'm afraid my nephew is a little absent-minded. He certainly did see me when I came in as far as the door and glanced in. "'Then there is no doubt of the fact that you were in the reception room at the time?' "'None whatever,' replied the bookkeeper suavely, thus unconsciously giving the lie direct to his nephew. "'You didn't have that package of bonds in your hands again after sending them to Mr. Lockwood by this boy?' "'No, sir,' replied Reese glibly. "'How were they done up? In a white wrapper on which was the stamp of the Manhattan Trust Company. The wrapper was intact when you sent the bonds to Mr. Lockwood?' I am certain of it. How then do you account for the fact that a portion of that wrapper with a stamp came to be lying under the safe behind your desk? This question staggered the bookkeeper, and he turned a sickly white. Mr. Reese, said the detective coolly, what did you do with those bonds? Sir, ejaculated the bookkeeper, you don't accuse me. I am sorry, but I am compelled to arrest you and your nephew for theft and conspiracy. Get your hats and coats, both of you. End of chapter 13